me tell you something that was surprising to me in my beginning leadership journey. I discovered that a lot of leaders don't develop leaders. In fact, I don't know, but I would say 85 to 90 percent of all leaders, they have followers. They have people that follow them and they kind of give them direction and kind of give them a course of action. But only 10, 15 percent of the leaders I know really develop leaders. Uh, and there's a problem because the only people who can develop leaders are leaders. Uh, you've got to be one to be able to grow one and people do what people see. And so if you're going to develop leaders, you have to learn to lead yourself, but then you have the avenue to teach and train others. And yet most leaders never take advantage of it. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But I was so compelled to speak on the subject that several years ago now, I wrote a book called Developing the Leaders Around You. And here's what I know. If you develop yourself as a leader, that's a wonderful thing. You can lead people, you'll have followers. But there is no continuation of what you're doing because they're just followers. You have to develop a leader so that you can not only reproduce yourself, but because you can extend and expand yourself. You can go further and you can get broader when you begin in developing leaders. And so developing the leader around you is all about empowerment, how to find these potential leaders, how to pour into their lives and begin to give them what they need so that you truly can stop adding and begin multiplying. Remember this, when you lead followers, you add. But when you develop and lead leaders, you multiply. Well, welcome to another Unplugged at Bettendorf Campus. I am so glad that you are here. At Heritage, that is one of the things that we are dedicated towards. We want to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches because we understand that if we're going to accomplish the mission that's before us, if we are going to live out the vision that we are being challenged to, we are going to need a group of leaders, not just now but in the future, to carry that torch, to carry that baton and move us forward. So today I'd like to talk to us a little bit about, about leadership and have a leadership development moment together. What are we looking for? What are we learning along the way? And admittedly, today's teaching is going to look a lot more like a staff meeting than it is a preaching time. One of the things we do at staff meeting is we like to carve out some time in it to focus on leadership development, to learn more. Why? Because leaders are consummate students. Leaders are always learning. Leaders are always growing. Leadership is important. And whether we'd like to think about it or not, almost all of us, if not all of us in this room, are leaders or have leadership moments at some times in our lives. Whether you are a parent or a grandparent raising up the next generation of kids and leading them into understanding what it means to be a person in our society and have a successful life. Whether you're a person that's involved in the community, maybe a sports team, or perhaps you're part of the PTA. Whether you're here in the church and perhaps you lead a small group or you're part of a classroom or some other leadership thing. Or if in your workplace you are a, a boss, a manager, a leader, you have people that report to you and you report to people. At some point, almost all of us, if not all of us, are going to engage in leadership. Because at any time we are involved in equipping and resourcing others in order to accomplish a goal, we are engaged in leadership. One of our missions, in fact, our mission statement here at Heritage Church says this. It says to meet people where they are in their spiritual journey. And maybe you've noticed this before, maybe you haven't. What's those next three words? And lead them. And lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ in order to change the world. At Heritage Church, we are dedicated to engaging our culture where they are, to meet them where they are in that spiritual journey. We are dedicated to building bridges with them and not barriers. And we're calling on leaders to go out and be strong leaders in their homes, leaders in their communities, leaders in their workplaces, because our desire is to change the world. And so leadership is a necessity. So I'd like us to take a little bit of a journey to learn what does it mean to be a leader? Not just here, 
but anywhere. And I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey. You, you could be here today and saying, I'm just not even sure about this God stuff. I'm not even sure about who Jesus is and whether or not I, I believe in him. And that's great. Or maybe you're one of those people that's been on a journey with Jesus for many years of your life. And you feel strong in that journey. And there's many of us that are in between. I believe that no matter where you are, what we're going to learn today about leadership, what I believe is biblical leadership, but what we're going to learn today about leadership is applicable, not just at church, but it's going to be applicable in your family, it is going to be applicable at work, and it's going to be applicable in the community. And so I want to encourage you to grab your notes and, and take some notes today, because I believe this is going to be valuable as we grow and learn to be better leaders in our lives. So welcome to staff meeting. I'd like to start our staff meeting today by just talking about an Old Testament story real quick before we get going. We're not going to cover the whole story because it's too, many, too long in the, in the Bible. But God sent Moses down to Egypt to bring the Israelites out of slavery. They crossed the Red Sea and they're in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. One of the things Moses did during this time is anytime there was a dispute, anytime there was an issue or a problem, the Israelites would bring that to Moses and he would give a judgment on it or he would make a decision on it. He was the chief judge. One day his father-in-law came to visit him and observe what he was doing and that's where we pick up the scripture, if you have your Bible and you want to look it up, it's in Exodus 18. If you have an electronic device, it'll be on the screen, and it's in your worship guide as well. But starting in Exodus 18, verse 17, we, re we hear this. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. So instead of Moses' father-in-law saying to him, man, you're doing a great job. I love what you're doing. I love how things are going, man. Kudos to you. No, he looks at him and he says, if you keep up doing what you're doing at this pace, you're going to burn out. This is way too much for any one person to do. He continues on with that discussion in verse 19. He says, listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. You need to be a leader to them. You need to model this behavior. You need to teach, equip, and resource them to do the work. He goes on later to say you need to appoint some men from within Israel to be judges to hear all these cases so you don't have to hear them all the time. And if a case comes your way that's a little too tough for them, then they can bring that case to you. But there is absolutely no reason, Moses, you should be hearing every single case. Why? Well, he tells them why in Exodus 18, 22, That it will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. What's get, which gets us to one of our first leadership principles. Probably we knew this already, but just in case, it's a great reminder. Leadership is about sharing the workload and influencing others to accomplish more than we could ever accomplish alone. It's about sharing and influencing. It involves equipping and resourcing people to accomplish more than any one individual could ever accomplish because life and leadership is about people and relationships. And a successful life and leadership is found in how we engage people. As leaders, we are going to engage all sorts of people in our journey. And how we engage them and how we manage that relationship and understand it will go a long way in determining how effective we will be as leaders out there. So we need to understand the people we are engaging and how we engage them. Many years ago, a gentleman named Gordon McDonald wrote a book called Restoring Your Spiritual Passion. In this book, he identified five different types of people that he often came across, and I have found these five 
definitions to be very helpful in my leadership journey, and I want to share those with you today because I believe they will be helpful. And you will engage these people not just here at church. You will engage people like this in your family. You will engage people like this in the community, and you will engage people like this in your workplace. So let's discuss a few of these people if we could. The first one are what I call VRPs. These are very resourceful people. VRPs are people that ignite our passion. They are peers. They are our mentors. These are a handful of people, and I mean it. These aren't a lot in our lives. These are those handful of key people in our lives that speak wisdom into our lives, that truly inspire us to become something more than we think we could ever be. They add to our lives. They set our passions ablaze. They're mentors. They're wiser, older people. They usually come to us with the, I've been there, I've done that, let me tell you what I experienced when I went through that. And we need people like that in our lives if we're to navigate leadership successfully. Which brings a question, who's mentoring you? Who's mentoring you? I'm not talking about who's your golf buddies here. Who's mentoring you? Who is that wise person? Whether that's in your industry or whether that's teaching you about what it means to be a better husband, wife, father, mother, whatever it may be, who's speaking into your life and modeling this behavior? Because we have to have mentors in our lives. The second group of people we encounter are VIPs, and just as the name implies, they are very important people. These are people that share our passion and our vision. They are not afraid to ask the tough questions, to challenge us, and to inspire us. They share our passions and our vision. These are your teammates, your co-workers, your close friends. VIPs are the people in your life that get it done. You need VIPs in your life. These are the folks that get out there and get it done. And what's interesting about VIPs is VIPs don't have to spend a lot of time trying to get along or debating about who's right or trying to figure out who's in charge. VIPs understand the mission. VIPs understand the cause. And they are razor sharp focused and they are passionate about getting it done you got to have as a leader VIPs around you. And the leaders around you need you to be a VIP for them. Next set of people that we have to pay attention to in our leadership journey are what we call VTPs, very trainable people. Very trainable people. They catch our passion. They catch our vision. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. They are the next generation of leaders, the next ones in line. These are the people that Dr. Maxwell was talking about that we have to pay attention to, that we have to build up, that we have to resource, that we have to equip. As leaders, we have been called to make an investment, a deliberate investment into their lives. We have to give them real, very real opportunities to succeed. But even more importantly, and this may surprise you, we have to give them very real opportunities to fail. And you say, boy, that surprises me. But if you think back in your own leadership journey, truly, what did you learn more from in life? What you got right or what you got wrong? Right? I don't know about you, but I am a continuing student in the school of hard knocks. Leaders learn from their mistakes. Leaders grow from their mistakes. Around here, I say we always have a mythbusters philosophy, which means failure is always an option. In fact, to me, true failure, the only real failure out there is being so afraid to try you don't. That's failure. Failing to try is failure. Leaders try. And if you want to have a creative environment in your family, in your workplace, wherever it may be, failure has to be an option. Real leaders, they fall down, they get up, they wipe the dust off, and they try again. And they don't make the same mistake twice. That's leadership. 
but we must not be afraid to try. And we have to create an environment around here that says, it's okay for you to fail and try. Just don't do it again. Next group of people are called the VNPs. These are very nice people. VNPs love our passion and they enjoy the vision, but they don't really want to do any of the work. These are folks that will pat you on the back. They'll tell you what a great job you're doing. They love it. They love what they see. They love what you're doing. Awesome job, man. But they don't do any of the work. These are genuinely nice folks. But the minute you ask them to raise the bar on their leadership, the minute you give them a real opportunity to lead or to grow, they magically disappear. And you don't know where they went. These are folks that essentially want to give you their opinion, but not their time. Got any of those in your life? As Gordon MacDonald noted in his book, he says, we must not confuse their kindness with their commitment. Don't confuse the two. Finally, the last group, VDPs. These are very draining people. VDPs are people that sap our passion. They will suck you dry, constantly draining you. They demand your time and attention. They even probably know the right things to say. But they never grow. They never change. They have a way of elbowing their way into your conversations and elbowing their way into groups and to leadership. And they have no filter to understand that they're being disruptive in the process. So here's some warnings I want to give you about very draining people. Number one, VDPs do not know they are VDPs. They don't. They don't know. They don't know that they're VDPs and trying to tell them, uh, good luck. Number two, VDPs are attracted to a healthy group of people like a mosquito is drawn to blood. They look for them and they seek it out. There's something in their life, they don't know what it is, they can't describe it, but there's a hole in their life they need filled. And they go and look for help to try to, try to fill it and healthy people and healthy organizations. The third and probably most important, a healthy group of people will lose its momentum and its vibrancy if VDP people begin to monopolize your time and your energy. You will. You will lose your momentum. You'll lose your vibrancy. You will lose your excitement. You will lose your will to go forward. VDPs will suck it out of you. And allow me to clarify something real quick if I could. Life is full of seasons. There are good seasons and there are bad seasons in our lives. There are times when things seem to be going well and there are times when things aren't going well and you're hurting. And that's not what I'm talking about here. It is at times like that that we, the church, need to step into your life and be the people of God to lift you up, to help you, to get you through that season. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a difference between I have a need, which is a season, and I am a needy person, which is a lifestyle. Many of us, if we think hard and look around us in our families, at work, in the community, probably could identify some people whose lives just seem to be one constant soap opera. One long drama. One thing after another just seems to go bad for them. Why? Because they feed off of the negative energy and attention they get from it. Don't they? But the problem is this. We have to ask ourselves as leaders, who receives our time and attention and how much? Because your time is limited. They're not making any more hours in a day. Your time is limited. And as leaders, we are called to be good managers and good stewards with the time God has given us. 
And so we have to ask the question, who receives our time and attention and how much? And I get it. It's never fun to tell someone, I can't meet with you. I can't engage you in this right now. And if the person is a true VDP, I will promise you they won't understand. They won't. I'm saying people are important and that people do matter. But your time matters too. We're called to be good stewards with the time God gives us to which we will someday give an account. What are you doing as a leader to advance the kingdom of God within your sphere of influence? Are you managing your time well? Because as we engage these people, we'll realize that people respond to their circumstances in about four different ways. And you may respond to your circumstances in at least one of four different ways. Pastor Sean talked about these just a few weeks ago, and I want to cover them again if I could. You will see your circumstances as either happening to you or happening for you. You will see your circumstances possibly as happening around you or with you. If you see and look through the lens of life that your circumstances are happening to you all the time, you will see yourself as a victim. A victim is a person that blames everybody else for what's happening around them. It's everyone else's fault. I am simply a product of my environment. There's nothing I can do about it. Life just fed this to me and I've got to live it out. Everyone's out to get me. But we're not called to live as victims in our Christian walk. We're called to rise above that. If we see our circumstances in life as happening for us, what we will have is a consumer mentality. Oops. We will see ourselves as a consumer, which is pretty common in our American capitalist culture. In the church world, a person that sees themselves as a consumer is a person that views the church as a purveyor of spiritual goods and services that they are shopping for. I am looking for the church that gives me what I want, as if we're some kind of restaurant. Consumers shop around and hop around from church to church looking for the place that has your theology, your philosophy, your programs. Your way of doing things. And when a church cannot provide you with the goods and services that you are purchasing, what do you do? You take your business somewhere else. Rather than seeing that the church is not a building and it's not a place and it's not a purveyor of goods and services, the church is the people of God on mission to the world. Church is people, not a place. Another word for this would be entitlement. We feel entitled to what is owed to us. We've earned it. We deserve it. And I know that's tough language. But this is rampant in the American culture. I love the story of the rich young ruler in the Bible in Mark chapter 10. The rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and asks him a a simple question. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler then begins to inform Jesus, I've followed all the commandments and all the rules since I was a young boy. I've been a really good person. Jesus' answer surprised him. In verse 21, he said, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, first I want to clarify, this is not Jesus giving a formula for all of us to follow. 
Jesus wasn't saying, this is how you come to get eternal life. Everybody do this. Everybody go sell all your stuff. That's not what he's doing. Jesus understood this man's heart. Jesus knew that in this man's heart, his stuff, his money, his things reigned supreme. It was the most important thing in his life. And Jesus was calling it out. He was saying, if you want to follow me, I have to reign supreme in your life. And all the other stuff has to go. The man's response in verse 22, it says, At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This man didn't hear what he wanted to hear. This wasn't what he was looking for. This wasn't the movement, and this didn't have the philosophy of what he thought it should be. And so he laughed. He was a consumer looking for something that matched his agenda, and his lifestyle. And what's interesting is you don't read Jesus chasing after him, going, wait, 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 wait. Hey, 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 you know what? Maybe that was too much. I tell you what, how about you go sell half of it, and I'll meet you, you know, we'll figure the other half out later somewhere along the way. He doesn't do that. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it will cost you no less than everything. You must surrender it all. What happens when our theology, our personal theology, what happens when our philosophy, what happens when our agendas, what happens when our definitions of the way things are supposed to be confront the Jesus of the Bible? What are you going to do then? Will you walk away as the rich young ruler did? Or are you willing to lay it down and say, maybe I have more to learn? Because leaders grow and leaders learn. If life and your circumstances happen around you, you will be a spectator. You are comfortable to watch it play out from your chair, from your seat. These are the very nice people we talked about. I like what I see. I like what's going on. But I don't think I want to jump in. I don't think I want to be a part of that. I just enjoy seeing the game played out, but I have no intention of jumping in and getting dirty and being a part of what's going on. And we're not called to do that either as Christians. I love this poem from Walt Whitman. He says, O me, O life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, what good is this, O me, O life? The answer? That you are here that life exists an identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. This coming year, what verse are you going to contribute? What part are you going to play? What's your role in what's going on? Because this much I know, Christianity was never designed to be a spectator sport. It wasn't. For a spectator, church is something you mark off your list. It's like the gym. I go to the gym. When I need a spiritual refill, I just go to church. Church is something we do in a place we go. Rather than seeing us as the sent people of God to which we are a part, which gets us to the next opportunity. We can choose to look at life and see life is happening with us. To happen with us means that we understand that we are a part of a community. We are part of a team. We are part of a group of people who choose to go forward and make a difference in the world through Jesus Christ. That what Jesus was calling us to was to be God's people on mission to the world. 
To see life as with is to realize that we cannot do life alone. To see life as with means to partner with others in in God's great mission to change the world. That is why Jesus spoke about kingdom so many times in the Gospels. He said, that's why I was sent, to preach the kingdom. What Jesus was saying is, I am creating a new movement. I am creating a new thing, a group of people who will bear my name, that will shine my light out into the world, to show the world that there is hope and healing, that there is forgiveness, that they can be reconnected to God, and that they can be set free from their bad habits, their bad ways. They can be the people I created them to be. That's good news. We are called to do life with each other as a community of people. And I love this verse in Philippians 1. It says, I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel, the good news from this day forward. We are called to be partners in bringing the good news to the world, which gets us to our so what moment. I've challenged you to go out and understand the people you are engaging, and even more so, which one of those people are you? We challenge you to ask yourself, what lens do I look at life through. And I'm calling you to consider that we are called as the people of God to do life with each other, to partner with each other, to do life together. But what does that look like practically speaking? Here in the church, we have a set of commitments amongst the leadership team and amongst, amongst the staff that we hold each other to. And today, I want to challenge the entire church to them because I believe these commitments are valuable not only in the church, but they're invaluable at your home. They are invaluable in your workplace and wherever you may go. These are commitments I want to challenge us to as a campus in the coming year. This is what it means to do life with each other. And so they're important. And the first one is this. We will commit to integrity. We will maintain a life of personal integrity, particularly when nobody's watching. Are you the same person on Monday you claim to be on Sunday? Who are you when nobody is looking? And when we talk to each other, are we speaking truth and love? Are we being open and honest with each other? It's critical if we're going to be the people of God. The second one is this, prayer. We will pray for each other. Prayer is a big deal. The leadership team around here, whether that's Sean or the pastors or the leaders throughout, they need your prayer and you need ours. We are a praying people and we believe prayer works and we believe prayer is powerful. I believe a church that is on its knees crying out to God is a church that will make a difference not only in its community but throughout the world. And no great movement of God has ever begun without a group of people who are on their knees. No great movement has ever begun of God without people on their knees. We will pray. Number three, we've talked about partnership. We will trust and defend each other. We will not talk about each other behind each other's backs. We will not be gossips. We will not have meetings after the meetings. I have to know you've got my back. And you've got to know I've got yours. We have to trust each other in that. Four, clarity. We will communicate open, honestly, and respectfully. Truth and love, but how you say something sometimes, more times than not, is more important than what you say. Paul said that in Corinthians. He says, You can speak with the tongue of angels, but if you have not love, you are simply a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you're just noise. It doesn't matter how right you are. It doesn't matter how important your point is. If it can't be said in love, you're just noise. Proverbs says your words have the ability to speak life or death. We must commit to building each other up and speaking life into each other if we're going to be the people God wants us to be. Next one, peace. 
We will deal with tension in a healthy, biblical way. We will choose to build each other up rather than tear each other down. And notice I did not say we will avoid tension. You cannot avoid tension. In fact, leaders will engage tension because you know what leaders really hate? True leaders, leaders hate status quo. They don't like status quo, and they will push at it, they will pull at it, and they will stretch at it, which will cause tension. Because without tension, things don't grow. So tension is going to happen. And the Bible seems much more interested in how we engage tension than whether or not we avoid it. Will we engage that tension in a healthy, biblical way? Results. We will be good stewards of our call to this team. We've talked about stewardship real quick. What is stewardship? Stewardship is when you have been placed in charge of someone else's stuff. It's not yours. The Bible's all about us being stewards of God's stuff. Psalm 24 one says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's God's stuff. And as stewards, we're called to use God's stuff for God's purposes. It belongs to him. You've been placed in charge of managing it. How are you doing? This includes your time. This includes your resources, your talents, your skills, and it includes your money. How are you doing with it? Accountability, the last one. We will choose to be accountable to our values. And even more importantly, we will choose to be accountable to each other. Just as I asked earlier about mentoring, I want to ask you this question too. Who are you accountable to in life? Everybody needs to be accountable to somebody. Pastors included. Everybody. Who are you accountable to? And I'm not talking about your spouse. Yes, you are accountable to your spouse, but I'm talking beyond that. Men, where's another godly man that you are accountable to in your life? Women, where is another godly woman that you are accountable to in your life? We must be accountable to each other. Because as leaders, we are called to use our time wisely, and so we have to ask ourselves, who are the people that are around us, and how are we engaging them? We have to ask ourselves how we see the world around us and the circumstances around us. And if we're going to be the people of God that live out the mission that we're called to do, we're going to have to be a people that agree to partner with each other and commit to each other all these things we just talked about. One of the things I love about Pastor Sean, the more and more I talk to him, is he loves to dream big dreams. As he talks with God, as he seeks God's counsel, he believes that God has God-sized dreams for this church, and I love that. I love it. But if we're going to be the people of God, if we're going to live loved, linked, and sent, if we're going to multiply disciples, leaders, churches, if we are to be the sent people of God, then we are going to have to be great leaders. We're going to have to be people that understand how to engage our time. We're going to have to be leaders that understand that we are doing life and can accomplish more together than we ever could just by ourselves. And we have to be leaders that are committed to building each other up rather than tearing each other down. Because God wants us to dream God-sized dreams. And I believe that God has great things in store for us in this coming year and beyond. And I'm asking you to commit to those things. And I'm asking you to join us on God's great mission to radically change the world. As the poem said, and that you may contribute a verse What's your verse to contribute this year? What part will you play? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we've gotten a lot thrown at us today. But Lord, we want to be challenged, reveal to those things in our heart that need to change so that we can be the people you want us to be. Help us to grow and be more like you. Help us to be the people who see others as you see them. Help us to dream God-sized dreams. May we never be afraid to try. And may we be dedicated to doing life together in all that we do. It's in your name. Amen.